All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for sticking around for the last session of the day uh, here at the Build 2014 conference. I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about uh, diagnostics and diagnosing issues in Windows Phone applications. But first, I want to start off with some bad news. So other than the fact that my demo is not working entirely as expected because of the Wi-Fi connectivity in here today, uh, the other bad news that I have is that if you've always written code correctly the first time, if it's always behaved just as you expect, it's never had any unexpected errors or issues in it, and it's always been as fast and reliable as you want, then this session's not going to be very interesting for you. So given that everyone's still here today, I'm going to take that as a good sign. <clears throat> because I'm going to be telling you how to diagnose issues that is any of the things that I just mentioned in your Windows Phone 8.1, the new platform that was announced today, XAML applications, using Visual Studio 2013, and in particular, Update 2. Now, I'm, my name is Dan Taylor. I'm from the Microsoft Visual Studio Diagnostics team. And I love diagnostics. I love working on it, and I love talking about it. And just to prove to you how much I like working on diagnostics, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about myself. So I just got married this weekend on Saturday. So thank you. And I didn't say that to, to garner your applause, but rather to tell you that uh, I decided that I should skip my honeymoon so that I could be here today to talk to you. So <laughs> I, I really like this stuff. So what is this session all about? This session is about helping you find and fix issues quickly uh, in your application. So instead of you standing there, beating your head against the table, wondering why your code isn't working properly, you can spend your time building more features into your application. And second, I want to help you build fast, reliable, and fluid applications so that your app is more desirable to use, uh, it's, it, so that you can have more users, and more happy users, whether you just want bragging rights so that you have the most popular app in the store, or you want to increase the revenue that you're able to get from the store. Now, I hope many of you have Visual Studio installed right in front of you. And if you do have Visual Studio installed, you have all the tools you need uh, to accomplish these things. <clears throat> so what are we going to cover today? Uh, we're going to be covering, uh, we're going to be focusing on a demo on Windows Phone 8.1 store apps built using C Sharp and XAML. Now, when I say C Sharp and XAML, I do not mean Silverlight, even though Silverlight uses XAML. I'm talking about the new converged uh, XAML framework that's shared with Windows. And because of that, almost all of the content that I'm showing you today applies to XAML apps on Windows as well. And I'll be referring to them as XAML apps throughout the talk. Now, because I'm from the diagnostics team. We try and do things that apply as broadly as possible to as many platforms as possible. Many of these features do apply to Silverlight 8.0 and 8.1. They apply to other app types, such as desktop and ASP.NET, and other platforms. And I'll try and call out uh, where that is the case. In particular, the debugging features have the broadest reach. OK. So I've got a demo here. It's mostly working. and. Uh, I'm going to take a lap through this demo with the debugger, and I'm going to cover the features that I have up here, and then I'm going to go into some performance analysis tools. And this is a very demo-heavy session. It will be 90% Visual Studio and code, and so I appreciate you saving any questions you have until the end, because we have a lot of content to cover today. So let's just jump right in uh, into the debugging, and we're going to start with a demo. And in particular, we're going to show you how to debug swallowed exceptions, async code, uh, JSON, and data binding. And so if I switch over here to my phone and my laptop, I've got a project here open in Visual Studio. I've got this app that I've been working on. By the way, I planned my wedding in two weeks, and I've been working on this app for over a month. So, <laughs> so my app is called Photo Filter. I'm just going to come in here, and I'm going to F5 the application. And this is going to deploy to the phone. I've got this application DUV viewer. What it's doing is it's actually projecting my phone up onto the screen. 
And so everything I'm doing today is, is debugging directly to the phone. And so uh, what's happening here, there's two things that are happening. First, I'm expecting that this application is downloading some pictures from the cloud, uh, and then it's also getting some pictures from my camera roll. And I can scroll through the list of pictures here, and I can click on a picture, and I can apply an image filter to one of these pictures uh, so that it makes it look prettier because I hear that's something people like to do these days. Okay. So we'd like to debug this application. There's two things wrong with it. First, it's not getting any pictures down from the cloud. And second of all, I'm not seeing any uh, it names beside the pictures here. Now, I F5 the application with Visual Studio. It's not breaking. So what do we do? Where do we start? Should we start stepping through code randomly, looking through the solution explorer, trying to find what, what's at fault? And before I give you the answer, I'm going to ask a question. How many people in here regularly use the output window as part of their debugging process? Great. That's most of the people in the room. So uh, if you're not one of those people that looks at the output window, I would take a look at the output window because it <laughs> provides all sorts of uh, information about errors that you may not have seen while, while you pressed F5. And there's two errors in here. There's one error. The first error is this first chance exception. And we're going to start by looking at that. So when the debugger doesn't break, you can go ahead and look at the output window. And that will provide you a good clue of where to start debugging your application. So what a first chance exception is, how many people in here are familiar with first chance exceptions? Okay, that's, that's a, a good portion of you. Uh, many of you will know first chance exceptions as those, uh, those exceptions that always come up for some reason, and you don't know why. So uh, what the first chance exception is, is the debugger has detected that an exception was thrown in your code, but it was <coughs> swallowed so that my application here could still come up even though it wasn't working properly. And so what I can do is I can configure the debugger so that it actually breaks on, the, on the, the exception when it was thrown so that I can see where these errors occurred in my code that were being handled properly. So what I should do is I should go to debug exceptions. Sorry, I'll do that again. I did that pretty quickly. Debug exceptions to bring up the exceptions dialog, and that lets me configure what the debugger's behavior is on exceptions. And I'm going to say that I want the debugger to break when exceptions are thrown in managed code and then I'm going to click OK. And this time, when I F5 my application, what's going to happen is I should expect the debugger to break on the line of code that's failing, and we'll see what happens. So it's starting up. It'll break any minute now. And there it is. So all we did was turn on first chance exceptions, and now we're being taken to a line of code uh, that is likely a problem. And in this case, I'm seeing that uh, an HTTP request exception occurred. So this is telling me why the images didn't download from the cloud. Now, this is not the exception I was planning on happening, but it works just as well. This is a debugging session. Um, uh, I was originally planning on this phone actually being able to download the pictures from the cloud, uh, but that it would parse the data incorrectly and fail. However, this is just as good. So if we look at the call stack window here, we'll see a, new fe a feature that's very new for Windows Phone 8.1. Uh, we introduced uh, a bunch of asynchronous debugging features in Visual Studio 2013 for Windows 8.1. And if you used Windows Phone 8.0, you wouldn't have seen anything on the call stack below this line here that says external code. So you wouldn't have seen anything that showed me how did I get to this particular line of code because of the way that uh, the wonderful async await feature is implemented. So now with Windows Phone 8.1, Visual Studio is now async aware. We've got async call stacks for Windows Phone, Windows, ASP.NET, and desktop. Great. So I can actually click up, up the async call stacks and see what led, which functions actually led to this function being called. <coughs> now, uh, another feature that's uh, in this section of code, so that uh, I might not be able to show today, is that in Update to a Visual Studio, we have actually added a JSON visualizer. So I can take a string that I get from the server, it comes back in a JSON payload, and uh, 
instead of using the normal text visualizer, I can click and use the JSON visualizer. And actually, I'll, I'll, I'll try and show that to you later today. Okay. So the next thing we want to look at, uh, so unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get this to work, so I'm just going to uh, comment out this line of code so that our application starts up faster. So I'm not going to try to get the pictures from the server. So now we want to look at why the picture names are not showing up. <clears throat> so when I F5 the application, it's going to start up a lot faster uh, because it's not connecting to the server. And now I'm going to see that there's no picture names showing up here. And again, remember I said look at the output window. If we look at the output window, we see that there is a bunch of data binding errors. Now, if you've spent time writing XAML code, which anyone who's developed for Windows Phone or Windows Store apps or Windows has likely spent some time writing XAML code, data binding issues are some of the most difficult issues to diagnose. And here we have in the output window uh, that data binding errors are automatically shown and it tells you what happened. So here it says that the image name property uh, was not found on this photofilter.imageItem class. So what this is telling me is that in my XAML code, I've got a data binding property titled uh, image name that it's looking for on this image item class, and it doesn't exist. So I can go right to my solution explorer, and I can go to the image item class, and I can look for that image name property, and sure enough, it is not here, and instead I see a name property. So what I can do is uh, I can go to my XAML code and look for where I am using that image name property, and uh, it's clearly right there, and I can just change this to name, and everything should now work as expected. So now when I start my application up, here we go. We will now see names of the images, and all I did was look at the output window and follow the clues from there. Okay. So what did we just see? We saw first chance exceptions, uh, that you can turn these on and you'll break where exceptions are thrown. And we saw async debugging in the call stack window so that you can see the ca causality of async code and figure out how did I get to the particular piece of async code that I'm in right now. And what I didn't show is that you can actually go to the tasks window to see all the active uh, awaiting, uh, awaits in your code, and uh, you can actually click in these and it will hydrate the other debugger surfaces, and you'll see uh, all the locals and parameters and something like that. And this is very useful for finding long running ap operations in your code, so if I'm waiting on a long running request from a server or somewhere else, uh, I can just uh, pause the debugger and then I can look at the tasks window to see what's happening. And, and finally, uh, I've shown it up here. You can click the little uh, watch glass icon on any string. This is new in Visual Studio Update 2 that the RC was released today. And you can use this to quickly look at JSON strings in your code, and you can search through the list, and it's, it makes your life a lot easier. And then I showed you that data binding errors are shown in the output window. And uh, another cool feature that you can do is you can actually register for a callback on data binding issues. And you can set a breakpoint on that callback so that you can cause the debugger to actually break when data binding errors occur in your code if you want to be proactive about finding them. Now, sometimes for data binding issues, you don't actually care if there's a data binding error because maybe there's just some features in your UI that you're not using. <clears throat> and a couple of things that I didn't get to show today. Uh, there's some lesser known features about the debugger that people don't know exist. This is one of them. Those, there's data tips in code. When you hover over uh, a line of code, you can actually, if you click that little pin icon, it'll pin the data tip into the code. So when you step through, anytime you step through that piece of code, you'll automatically see that variable updated in the editor. So that's just a little tip and trick for you to use. And this is very handy if you're uh, stepping through loops very frequently and you don't want to keep looking back and forth at the locals window. And another thing that you can do is, uh, how many people here have ever right-clicked on a breakpoint? 
great. So if you right click on a breakpoint, you can do lots of cool things. You can configure your breakpoint so that instead of breaking execution, it can log a message to the output window, and that's very handy if you want to trace through loops and other things like that. And you can actually set conditions on breakpoints so that uh, a breakpoint is only fired, uh, for example, uh, if uh, the image was coming from the cloud I have shown up here. And you can combine these two. Notice I have the condition and the when hit checked. So I can log to the output window on a certain condition, and I get a nice IntelliSense experience there. OK. So we're going to come back to uh, our demo. And this time, we're going to show you how to debug app lifecycle events. So when I switch back here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch that application again. But this time, I'm going to launch it from my start screen here. So say I've gone through this application, and maybe I've scrolled down through the list, and I've picked an image that I really like. <clears throat> and I switch away from the application, and I go check my news or something else. And uh, I come back. And it would be nice that if I came back, the current context that I had saved up as a user was still there, and I was still on that picture so that I could switch quickly, check a message, and come back to the app and continue what I was doing. However, when I come back, the application is restarting from the beginning. Now, suspend and resume uh, is a part of the, the XAML application model, and it should be handled for you automatically if you're using, if you start with the built-in templates. But for some reason, it's not working for us today. So how do we debug this? There's some code that runs as part of suspend and resume. So what we can do is we can come into the debugger, we can right-click on the toolbar, and we can turn on this debug location toolbar. And this debug location toolbar, when the application is running, will let us force the app to suspend, resume, and cause other background tasks to happen. So if I click this little drop down here, you can see I can suspend the app, I can resume the app, I can suspend and shut down the app, which means the app will suspend and then exit entirely, and which will happen if you're using a bunch of other apps on the system. And I can also trigger background tasks, and I have a, a background task here called the photo download task that I've implemented. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trigger this suspend and shut down, and this simulates what happens when my app gets suspended naturally so that I can debug it. If I click this, it's gonna suspend my application, and it's going to hit a breakpoint that I've set in the suspend handler of my app. And what I can do here is I can step through this piece of code, and it's gonna to get to calling the built-in suspension manager logic, which what this does is it's gonna save the current state of my app out to disk, so that it can be resumed correctly. And when I step over this, uh, let me try that again. I was actually not in the correct part of my app. So what that does is, if I navigate from page to page, it's gonna save the navigation back stack for me, and it's gonna save the parameters that I pass to each page. So when I come to this page, I've passed this image as a parameter to the page, and when I suspend the application, what's gonna happen is, when I step over this piece of code, I'm gonna get an exception thrown. This is a first chance exception again, that says, suspend didn't uh, succeed because that async call to save the navigation state of my code, uh, it tried to serialize a parameter that doesn't support serialization. So by default, the suspension manager will automatically serialize uh, all of the data that you pass to your different XAML pages. However, if they don't support serialization using the built-in data contract serializer, uh, it won't succeed. So if I look at my code, I'm looking for where I do frame.navigate, and since I wrote this code, I know exactly where I've done that. And I can come in here, and I can go to my solution. And sure enough, there is that frame.navigate in my code, and so I'm navigating to the image page, which shows the image, and I'm passing this descriptor object. 
So this descriptor object happens to not support serialization uh, because it has a constructor. So any uh, object that has a constructor can't be serialized automatically by default. And we could rewrite our code to not have a uh, destructor here, or sorry, a constructor. Uh, but instead, I'm just going to serialize this manually myself. So I can go back in here. So instead of passing this object, uh, what I can do is I can uh, serialize this to JSON. I can say JSON convert dot serialize object, and I can pass the descriptor directly. And so that's going to take that object and serialize it to a JSON string. And then when I come in to the image page class here, when I load up that image page, instead of casting the parameter that I pass directly, I can instead uh, take this as a string. And then I can deserialize that back into the image descriptor object. Okay, so now when I run this application, it will actually suspend and resume correctly now that I've uh, fixed this issue. And so if I navigate to this page here, and then I trigger that suspend and shut down again, what's gonna happen is uh, my application will actually suspend correctly and I can go back, and when I open the application up again, it's gonna come back to the page that I was on, and the navigation state of my code has been saved automatically for me so that if I press the back button, uh, the app continues to work as if the app remained running the whole time. So the next thing I wanna show you is how you can debug share contracts in your app. So, Apps are better when they can interact with one app to another, and new in Windows Phone 8.1, we have the share contract. And I've implemented the share contract in my application by, so that I can take an image from my camera roll. Here I've got a cat picture. This talk is going up on the internet, so it has to have cats involved with it. And I can come here and I can share this photo to my photo filter app, and we'll see in a second that it doesn't work. So, What's happening here is that the share contract activates my application, starts it up, but it starts it up through a different uh, path than what the debugger normally exercises when you press F5. So how do we debug the code that's, that's accepting the share contract here? Well, we have to change what the debugger does when you press F5. So we can come into the Solution Explorer here, go to Project Properties, and in Debug Settings, we can change the start action to say, don't launch my app, but deploy the app and attach the debugger when my code starts running. So when I come in here, so now I can press uh, start, and what this is going to do is it's going to uh, deploy the application, as I just said, and then now I can, without leaving this page, I can try sharing again, and I will hit a breakpoint now in my share contract handler. So when I come in here, I'm now in my, the activate, that the, the activation entry point for the share contract. And I can start stepping in through here. Everything looks normal. I'm looking for a bitmap image because I said I wanted to accept images for this share contract. And when I step over here, it doesn't enter that if condition. So something kind of unexpected here, what's happened is because I shared a picture from my camera folder. The file already existed on my, on my phone, so instead of getting a bitmap image, it's actually passing me a file handle to my share contract, and so I just need to accept the file, open the file, and pull the image out of it. And some super helpful developer has left the code in here right for me to use uh, to accomplish that. And this happens all the time, I know. So. Now when we try this, I'm gonna press F5 again. <clears throat> it's gonna deploy my app with the fix, and I can try sharing this cat picture to my photo app. And what happens here is now I'll hit that breakpoint again, 
uh, and I can step through it and see, sort of follow where the code goes. It does enter that uh, other if condition, and if I press F5, the shared contract works. I have now successfully shared this picture to my application. Okay. So what did we just see? So we saw that you can turn on the debug location toolbar and use lifecycle events to trigger suspend, resume, and background tasks within your application. Your application otherwise will not suspend while you're debugging, which is usually a good thing because when you're debugging, you kind of want your app to keep running so you can step through the code. <clears throat> and then we showed you how you can debug share contracts by changing the start action uh, in the project properties to debug the app when it starts, but don't start it uh, as normal. And for Silverlight, this, the equivalent feature would be to enable tombstoning. Okay, so that is the uh, section on debugging this application. Now I wanna bring out the heavy artillery. Most people, once they've gotten the application working, they will then go and try and uh, do tune performance all at once. So we're gonna take a look at how to improve the performance of this application, but first I wanna talk to you about what are the common performance problems that you should be looking out for in your app and what the tools in Visual Studio will help you diagnose. So the first, and, and I would say one of the most common performance issues, is that operations take a long time to complete. And that could be when you start up your application, uh, the, pay, the first page takes a long time to show up, navigating from page to page seems to take forever, and the UI, um, if I press a button, it might take a while for the results to show up on the page. Another common performance problem is that the UI is not responsive or choppy. So what this means is I can't actually interact with the UI. Imagine I press a button and the button locks in place, or I try and tap on a UI element and it doesn't do anything. Or say I'm just scrolling through a list, and when I scroll through the list, it, the frame rate drops and it doesn't look very good. <clears throat> Another common one is that the app drains the battery and users start to notice. If someone uses your application for a long enough period of time, they will inevitably associate any battery consumption of your app uh, with your app, and they will say, I'm gonna go find another application in the store that doesn't suck my battery away, uh, and this will happen. And then, Another very common one is if your application uses too much memory, especially on Windows Phone, it will be terminated. And so this is actually one of the differences between Windows Phone and, and Windows is that on Windows Phone, your application actually will has it be terminated if it goes over a hard limit of memory. And on Windows Phone 8.1, that's 180 megabytes for a 512 megabyte device. And when you're tuning performance of your applications on your Windows phone, or anywhere for that matter, I wanna stress that you should always use a release build on a physical device, because the performance characteristics of your code in a debug build uh, on the emulator are significantly different. And you wanna focus on fixing real performance issues that your users are running into and not uh, performance issues that only manifest themselves at debug time. So now I'm gonna dive into how to use some of the new performance tools that we've introduced into the update to a Visual Studio 2013 on this application. <clears throat> and I'm actually going to switch to a slightly different version of this application that uh, we'll say is uses more realistic or operates under more realistic conditions. So I'm just going to press Control F5 to run my app. I've got the release version, and I don't have uh, the debugger attached, and this will let me evaluate what the actual performance characteristics of this app are. And so it, when I was debugging the code, I actually limited the number of pictures it loaded to only 10 or so pictures, and Quite often when you're debugging, you sort of put yourself 
under, you put your app under non-realistic conditions just so you can get all the logic working. But I take a lot of pictures with my phone. It's a Lumia 920. Uh, it takes great pictures. It's pretty much the main thing I use my phone for other than keeping in touch with my wife, of course. So when I started up the application there, it actually took a long time. It took uh, several seconds to complete. I, I, sorry, I didn't count it out loud. It was actually about 10 seconds. And uh, when I click on one of these pictures, something interesting happens. If I notice that when I click filter, it takes a long time for the image filter to be applied. And I actually can't interact with my app while that's happening. So if I press the back button, it, the back button won't get hit until after that image filter uh, finished being applied. So we want to try and see what we can do to improve the startup performance of this app. And we want to run the tools that are available in Visual Studio right at your fingertips to do so. Now, Kevin Callow actually showed these this, in this morning's keynote. I was very happy to see that. So if you go uh, debug performance and diagnostics, what this is going to do is it's going to take you to the performance and diagnostics hub that we introduced in Visual Studio 2013. And when we come here, we've got a bunch of different tools that we can use to analyze the performance of our application, depending on which of those sort of four performance characteristics that I talked about uh, just, just a moment ago. Now, the startup of our application, uh, it seems UI related because it takes a long time to pop up the UI. So we're going to run the UI responsiveness tool. And I'm sure that my application was using CPU during that period of time. So we're going to run the CPU usage tool as well. And this is a new capability that we've added in update two of Visual Studio. Before you had to run one tool at a time, which meant you had to do multiple run of the tools and it made it more difficult to use. And, and before I show, start here, I'm just gonna say that we've got a bunch of different tools here available depending on the kind of application that you have. And the good news is we'll automatically show you the right tools that apply to the application that you're using. And when I click start, what it's gonna do is it's gonna run my startup project which is the default uh, F5 action, or the control F5 action. But I can use a bunch of different targets here to launch other apps in different ways. So all I did was debug performance diagnostics, or Alt F2 for short, checked a couple tools, and now I'm gonna click start. And what this is going to do is it's gonna launch my app, and it's gonna record a bunch of performance data. So I'm gonna count three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so about 10 seconds for this app to come up. I told you 10 seconds, I'm a man of my word. I have this nice live CPU graph here, uh, which allows me to uh, interact with the app, and I can actually see in real time the performance characteristics of this app in terms of its CPU usage. As I click back and forth, I can run through the different actions in this app, and uh, I can actually click this parallel button here and I can see that I can actually use more CPU when I use that uh, parallel button. So when I click Stop Collection, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to collect all that data back from the phone and generate a performance report for me to look at. I'm not going to make you wait for all that stuff to complete. I've got a saved version of this report here. <clears throat> and. Uh, this, this saved version of the report is actually with the full demo working, so it's got a few extra things in here, but I'll walk you through what those are. So I'm gonna press Alt, Shift, Enter here to make this full screen so that it's easier to look at. And what are we seeing here? So in this top section, we have what I like to call the KPIs or the key performance indicators, which help me find where the performance issues are in my application. I have a bunch of charts, and all these charts are selectable, so I can select any range of time here. And what happens is when I select that range of time, the bottom section filters to that range of time so I can then look at the details. So I can select a performance issue and then go look at the details. So here we see that there is about five, uh, looks like about 6.5 seconds worth of time taken up here uh, on this orange section. and you know, we want to know what this is. So it, we can look at the CPU usage here, and this tells me which functions we're using the CPU during the selected range of time. And this is a call tree, so it's showing me all the paths in my code sort of aggregated up 
and it's sorted by the ones that were using the CPU the most. Now, if I look at this tree, I see that a lot of time was spent in external code. This is normal. What external code means is it's work that the XAML framework is doing on your behalf. <clears throat> and I also see that I'm, my image item .get photo property is being accessed a lot. So what's actually happening here is the UI is requesting a lot of pictures, and then the XAML framework is loading pictures. Now I can look at a different aspect of this performance issue because I ran two tools at the same time. I can sort of look at the different pieces of information here. And so if I switch to XAML UI responsiveness, because that's the other tool that I ran, I can expand this group item control here. And this gives me a list of the XAML UI elements that were being drawn during this range of time and how long it took to draw each one. So if I expand this items control here, uh, and I just keep expanding following all the costs, I eventually see that it tried to draw uh, probably about 100 or so uh, list box items on my UI. So why did it draw over 100 list box items on my UI, that's each element in that list that I was scrolling through, when there's only 10 or so visible on the screen? This is called list virtualization, and when it works, you, it should only see the 10 to 15 or so pictures in here that the UI needed to display, and then as I scrolled through it, it would uh, on-demand load all the pictures in. And in this case, uh, we have a little hint here because all of this stuff was parented under this group item control here that because I'm using image grouping, sorry, I'm using this grouped items feature of the XAML framework, it's actually breaking list virtualization because the list box doesn't know how big the elements are. And what I'm using the group item for, if you remember, was to display that title there that said camera roll over top of my app. Now I can, I can show you how to rewrite your XAML code so that you don't need to use groups to show headers over the different sections in the list. However, what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna turn that off for the purposes of this demo. And like any good performance issue, we can just turn it off by changing a Boolean flag in our code. So this is gonna turn off that list virtualization. Now, the other performance report that I brought up, and so something that actually wasn't shown here is that uh, I've got a couple of these code markers that I've inserted in, into my code, and they tell me how long different operations took to complete. So when this app is working, uh, it actually tries to download some pictures from the server, and then after it downloads pictures from the server, it tries to get the pictures from my camera roll, and then continue on working. So these two operations happen uh, in sequence, but there's no reason that they can't be overlapped so that I can complete the overall sequence of events sooner. And so what I can do is to make the images download from the server at the same time that I'm loading images from my camera roll. Now again, this isn't going to actually change the performance characteristics of this particular app. What I could do is I can, instead of awaiting on that, this call here, I can get the task back from the call, which will allow the rest of my function to continue running. And then once I have loaded all the pictures from the camera roll, I can then await that task so that uh, this function will only continue once I've finished downloading the images from the server and getting the pictures from the camera roll. Okay, so now it should be faster when we start our app because we fixed those two issues. This time I'm going to rerun the performance tools and look at the energy consumption characteristics of my code. So I'm gonna check this energy consumption tool here and I'm gonna time how long it takes to start up. It should be faster now because we fixed that list virtualization issue. And this time when my app starts up, We've got one, two, three, four. Four seconds, all right. So we've made a 60% improvement in the startup time of our application by changing one Boolean flag. And now, as I scroll through the pictures here, you'll see that they just load on demand as I scroll through my list, which is a nice performance trade-off. <clears throat> now, I've got this filter and filter parallel button here. When I click filter, it takes a long time to complete, and it runs on the UI thread. 
and then when I click filter parallel, it will attempt to use more cores so that this action completes more quickly. Um, it actually takes the thread pool a little bit of time to warm up, so the very first time I click the button, it doesn't use more cores, but the second time I do, you can see that I'm using more CPU here. Now this is a dual core phone, so one core is actually 50% CPU. So now that I've recorded that, I'm kind of concerned that by using more cores in the phone that I'm gonna use more energy and it's gonna drain more battery in my application. So since I ran the energy consumption tool, what I can do is I can compare the energy characteristics of that sync and in parallel button. And I've already got a previous version of this report saved here. And I'm gonna full screen again. And I'm gonna zoom into one of these sections where I've clicked both that uh, parallel and sync button there. And from the code markers that I've put into my code, and these are inserted using the logging channel APIs in Windows Runtime, I can see that this is where I clicked the sync button, and I can select this range of time and it tells me that this completed in 827 milliseconds. And I'm not interested in these here. I want to compare energy and CPU. I can look at the energy consumption tab, and it's estimated how much battery that this, this sync button took. And it's telling me that uh, 0.21 milliwatt hours of battery were used. Now this is an estimate. Power consumption characteristics change uh, widely between devices, but we just wanna compare these numbers so that we can figure out which ones are better or worse. So we've got 827 milliseconds for the synchronous version of this code. And over here, we've got the asynchronous version of the code. I'm just gonna select this. And we see that because I used more CPU, the operation completed more quickly, and it completed in 670 milliseconds, so 20% or more faster and it used only 0.16 milliwatt hours of battery this time, even though I used more CPU. And previously it was 0.21. So sometimes you can actually use less battery by using more, C more of the CPU for a shorter period of time, and that's what the data is showing us here right now. <clears throat> and just quickly, remember I mentioned that Okay, it looks like I've hit a bug here. All right, so next we're gonna look at the mem memory usage characteristics of this application. There's actually a couple of memory leaks in here, and if we keep using this application, we'll see that it eventually crashes. Uh, and I'll show you exactly what happens. So I'm gonna come back into the Performance and Diagnostics Hub, and I'm gonna run this new memory usage tool which works on C Sharp, VB, and C++ code. It lets you see where memory is being used in your app. And if I actually go to the settings link here, it lets me uh, turn on native managed or both native and managed. And so I'm just gonna click start, and it's going to launch my application, and it's going to start recording information about the memory usage. Now the first thing I see is I see this big scary red line up here and it's red for a reason, and it's because if this number goes over this red line, that's when my app gets terminated. And I can change where this threshold is by clicking this drop down here, and this handy tooltip actually gives me the different memory limits for different devices. I can see that for a one gig device, I can use up to 380 megabytes of memory. However, usually you want your application to target as many devices as possible, so we recommend that you run uh, with the lowest, the lowest memory limit setting here. Okay, so where is the memory leak in our app? So if I navigate to an image page, and I click the filter button, and I come back, and I do that again, the memory usage of my app keeps growing. And so I noticed, and if I keep, kept doing this, it would cross over that red line and my app would be terminated. So at this point, we've seen a growth in memory, and in order to understand uh, all of that active memory, what we can do is we can take a snapshot. So if I click this Take Snapshot button, what that's gonna do is it's going to record all of the active managed and native memory that was, that was uh, using up memory at that point in time. 
And for managed memory, what it records is all the heap reference graphs, because managed memory, we can actually walk the entire managed heap. And for native, it tracks all the allocations that have not been deallocated at that point in time. Now, this memory is more, some of this memory I expect to be there, and some of it I don't. Now, in order to differentiate between those two kinds of memory, what I can do is I can, again, cause those memory leaks to happen by clicking on the different buttons here, and I can come back and take another snapshot. Now I've got two snapshots that I compare, that I can compare, and when I click stop here, it will allow me to compare the values in these two snapshots so that I can see where that growth in memory came from. <clears throat> and again, I've got the results for this file already saved from a previous recording. And so I'm just gonna open that up in the interest of time. And here I've got the two snapshots that I took and now that I've stopped recording, it lets me actually click on these buttons here. I can either click on the top level objects to see the breakdown of all the memory, either in the managed heap or the native heap. Uh, if, if I wanna look at the native heap, I can click on this heap button. And in XAML applications, there's usually a combination of both being used, especially if you're writing your UI code in C sharp and then you're using the native XAML framework. So it's very common to have a lot of native memory as well in your application. However, I wanted to look at the diff. Where, what was that growth in memory that happened as I was navigating between pages? So I can click on this plus button, and that's gonna take me to a diff view of, of memory. <clears throat> now, but by default, this actually hides a lot of small objects, and what I'm looking at here is that it's saying, uh, in the objects that are shown, uh, there was no new objects added, so what I can do is I can turn off the feature that hides all the small objects so I can see everything. However, it does introduce a bunch of, a little bit of noise. So now I'm looking at uh, all the memory that was added on the managed heap between those two snapshots. I see in this count diff column, it's telling me that plus three, plus two instances uh, of each object were added. Sorry, this window keeps popping up here. I can just make it go away. And what you wanna do here is you wanna start looking through this list and look for objects that you wouldn't expect to be added and objects that you recognize. So if I click on button here, what it's gonna do is it's, when I click on button, the bottom part of this report tells me all the references that are keeping that button alive. And if I expand uh, this reference graph here, I can keep tracing this all the way back until I have the root of the object that is keeping memory alive. And in this case, it looks like the window size change event handler is keeping the image page alive. And every time I navigate to the image page and navigate away, I expect the image page to be destroyed and a new image page to be created every time I navigate to it. However, it looks like the old image page is being held onto by this event handler that I've subscribed to. And I can do one of two things here to, to remedy the problem. I can uh, not subscribe to this event handler, or I can simply unsubscribe from this event handler when I navigate away from the page, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I come here, and I can, again, uncomment this helpful piece of code that somebody left in here, and this is unsubscribing from this window size change event handler that I subscribed to when I navigated to the page. <clears throat> now, this isn't the only memory leak in this application. There is a memory leak in the native code in this application. If I click on heap here, it now shows me the diff in native memory between those two snapshots. Now for native memory, it's just a bunch of allocations. And so what I'm seeing is all the allocations that were allocated in the first snapshot and were not deallocated by the time I took that second snapshot. So here we see that um, Again, we wanna look through this look list and look for things that we don't expect. I'm actually seeing that there was an allocation in this native function in my app, and it was about 30 megabytes of memory, and I can, I can expand this if I wanna see uh, the allocation stack that eventually led to this happening, but I can just go right to this function. It's in this image filter colon colon antique image function here. So if I open the C++ component that's in my application, and I go to that function, I can see 
some developer accidentally left a new here in the code because they were implementing it in different ways and left it in. So this is just a frivolous piece of code. I can actually delete it. And I've now fixed two of the memory leaks that are in this app. Now I can rerun the tool, and I can look at the memory usage, and I should expect it to now stay within a reasonable range. So once I start this application, um, this cat's name is Aloha, by the way. <laughs> it's my cat. So this time when I start the application uh, and I navigate through the app, we'll see that the memory usage actually stays with a nice consistent range and it won't be terminated. <clears throat> so here we go. So let me click on that. And memory does grow a little bit, which is normal. There's a lot of one-time initialization that happens in your XAML framework and your own app code. I've actually got some caching work here. So, but after we've warmed up all of the caches, I can continue using this application, and the garbage collector will actually collect uh, the, that image page, and as I keep going, now the memory growth stays within a nice stable range, and I come nowhere close to hitting that scary red line that means my app will be terminated. And if I wanted to, I could take some additional snapshots here just to validate that there are no memory leaks uh, in my code. So let's just do that. We come back, and we take another snapshot, and we can click Stop and look at it. So this time, when I come back and look at the report that we just collected, we'll actually see that the image page is no longer hanging around in between snapshots. The memory is staying within a nice stable range so if I open the diff report here, now it's only seven objects that were added, and these are a bunch of frivolous small objects, and there's usually a bit of noise in there. But we're no longer seeing that the button or the image page uh, in this list of objects, and there's actually very little being added here. Okay, that was a lot of stuff. What did we just see? So we just saw the Performance and Diagnostics Hub, which we introduced in Visual Studio 2013. And what we've done in update two of Visual Studio is we've made the same Performance and Diagnostics Hub work on the phone, and we've added the ability for you to run more than one tool at a time so that you can do your performance analysis faster and more effectively by cross-correlating different performance data. We've also added, so as I mentioned, you can run the CPU and XAML UI responsiveness tool together to see work being done on the UI thread and see which functions were using the CPU during that period of time. You can run the CPU usage tool with the energy consumption tool to estimate power consumption and evaluate trade-offs between CPU, network, and display. And the memory usage tool, which is new in the update to a Visual Studio, which is just released, allows you to monitor memory usage while your application is running, and you can take snapshots of C-sharp, VB, and C++ memory, and you can open those snapshots for a detailed breakdown of memory, and then you can diff snapshots to identify causes of growth in memory and memory leaks. So I hope that everyone here learned at least one thing today that will save them some time, and I hope it will save you some time over and over and over again so that your one hour uh, in this room is well spent. I didn't get a lot of time to go in depth on these features. I just touched on each one very lightly. But if you want in depth information on everything that we covered here and more, please check out our diagnostics blog. We've posted all the tools up here that we've in introduced with detailed walkthroughs. And it covers more than just phone, it covers uh, Windows, Windows Desktop, and ASP.NET applications as well. And if you're looking for other talks to go to, here are some of the related talks with related content. There is diagnosing issues in uh, HTML JavaScript applications and the F12 tools in IE. And there's uh, a talk that was earlier today on writing great uh, XAML apps with Visual Studio. 
And then on Friday, if you want some sort of hardcore performance analysis techniques, uh, I would recommend that you go to Lalisra's talk about analyzing performance issues in your Windows and Windows Phone applications to see how you get deep insights into what's going on inside of the operating system. So that's all I had. I hope you learned something. I'll open the floor to questions right now. Thank you very much for your time today. Yes? I think we need to go to the microphone for the questions. Is that correct? Yeah. If you have data binding errors that don't really show you anything in the output window, isn't there a way to um, set a property on the binding or to be able to like track down more specifically about the data bindings? Yeah, so are you talking about a property in the XAML code itself? I think so, yeah. So normally you actually had to, before you had to set some property in your XAML to see those data binding errors. Now they actually show up by default. Um, but what you can do is you can, uh, I did show this in the slides, inside of your application you can register for this event handler here so that when you get uh, data binding failures you get uh, more detailed information and you can set a breakpoint in here and so you sort of can catch those data binding issues. And that debug settings is off of what? Sorry? This dot debug settings is what? Uh, oh, there's lots of debug settings here that you can play with. So there's, um, there's a few things. Oh, I see, okay. It's, this is in the, uh, the app.xaml.cs, so this is kind of the global initialization yeah. for your app. And you can do things like, uh, you can turn on frame rate counters. Uh, there's uh, an overdraw heat map here that lets you see where your XAML code is overdrawing too much. So you can, you can turn on a few things here, and one of those is that you can subscribe to this binding failed event okay. and get a bit more information. Is there a way to see the rendered XAML? Pardon? Is there a way to see the rendered XAML? Um, you mean rendered For XAML? Inspected, see the properties? Uh, no, there's not. You're, you're talking kind of like the DOM inspector that we have for uh, HTML and CSS, JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. And That's something that we would like to do. It's not something that we have today, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. Sure. The first one is like, um, uh, is this applicable to Windows 8 XAML applications? Also, this memory optimization tool, whatever we have seen. Is this applicable to universal apps also? Yes, it, it should work for both of those. Okay, in that case, like, you know, uh, Although, if I... Um, you might have to be running on Windows 8.1 for it to, like right. it might be a Windows 8 application that's running on Windows 8.1. 8.1, 8. 8. 8. yeah. yeah. So I, I would look for the blog post that goes through the details of the tool. It should be posted right now, actually. Okay, so Good. the next question is like, uh, uh, if I have a 40 to 50 forms application, if I try to use this tool, it is actually taking minutes to hours of time to analyze the, uh, my application memory, and it's, it's really taking a huge amount of time. Are you, are you talking and about the .NET allocation profiler that's in the performance? Whatever program? we have seen, that the same tool actually, which is already available on Windows Phone 8. Oh, I see. Right. Uh, this is actually a different tool than what's on Windows Phone 8. Um, it has slight enhancements, like uh, the staking snapshot for the memory yep. optimization is not there in Windows Phone 8. Well, it actually collects uh, memory information much differently. Uh, but the problem is, like, the uh, time taken to the collection is tremendously huge. It's, but it's not bad, actually, with this new tool. Uh, it's actually yielding more than minutes, right? That uh, for this new tool, the, the performance is actually pretty good. Uh, we have a tool called PairView, which is also, you know, available on CodePlex yep. by Microsoft Guy. It's actually an excellent tool to, yep. optim you know, compare the memory screenshots for Windows 8 applications. Yeah, so by I'm any chance, if we can use the same PairView for Windows Phone 8.1, so I'm glad you I'm brought, brought up. I'm glad you brought up PairView because the implementation here is actually using a bunch of code from PairView. So if if PairView is is working well for you, you'll actually see that. Uh, this will have the same performance characteristics. Oh, and that much is very fast, thing. actually. I don't know, yeah. because while running, uh, while running this demo, you actually skipping that and trying to show the existing one. Yeah. But if you run the pair feud, I don't believe, I don't think like it, it actually takes a lot of time, just immediately shows the result. So the, the, uh, the thing that actually takes a long time in this case is actually the native memory. The managed memory is almost instant. Okay. The native memory, because it has to track all of the native allocations, it takes a long time to do that analysis. So. Yeah. I, 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 th I suspect you'll really like using this new tool that we've introduced for Windows Phone 8.1 apps. I think it'll work really well for you. And if it's slow, you can turn off the native portion 
and that you'll be able to look at the managed heap much more effectively. Yeah, uh, sorry to bother you on a final question. Yep, no problem. So uh, the memory line, the red line is uh, showing as 180 MB. Earlier it was 150 MB for 512 MB device and 300 MB for 1 GB, right? Why is it increased to 180 and 300 now? Or do I, we have any specific reason for it? Uh, I don't actually know why it's increased for Windows Phone 8.1, um, but it has. Uh, maybe, they, maybe they found more memory in the operating system to free up for applications, <laughs> but you've got a free extra 30 megabytes there. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. I hate even having to ask this question. Sure. What SKUs are the tools available in? Uh, these are actually all available in Express for Windows okay. Phone. OK, thank yeah. you. And some of these, uh, the CPU tool is available in Pro for desktop applications. You can actually use the new CPU tool I showed today on WPF applications and console applications in Pro and above. And all of our profiling tools have actually been moved down to the Pro SKUs of Visual Studio. Thank you. Yep, no problem. I just got to uh, check the time here. Are we? Sure. Can I take more questions? Yeah, it's the last session. Okay, last session. I can keep going. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this one's quick anyway. Um, in your memory leak example, yep. you identified the uh, window size change event handler as the source of the leak in, in that example. Yep. Um, I, I may have just missed this part. How did you identify that as the source? I basically looked for uh, things that I, you know, I'm a bit familiar with my code and things that I expect. I saw that the other, uh, the other objects in here, there was a routed event handler, and that's usually something that's internal to my XAML code, and I suspect that that will be cleaned up um, you know, it's sort of one of those internal references, and the GC can sort of clean it up. Um, Got it. So that spe specific event handler wasn't identified in the report, but the routed event was. It wasn't. It wasn't up. highlighted for you. However, I'm just trying to find that other report. Um, but basically, I just, you know, it's good to just go through one at a time and say, is it? Could this be the problem? Could this be the problem? And in this case, uh, if I look at the size change event handler, that one stands out to me and I can identify that with a piece of code that I have. Great, thank you. Yep, no problem. Hello. Yep. Um, a bunch of things. Um, one of the techniques we used to, or we used for Windows Silverlight 8.0 apps is we would manually force a lot of garbage collections just to tidy up the Sorry, the could, you, could you get closer to the microphone? I can't quite hear you. Sorry, I can hit, oh, that's fair. Um, in Silverlight 8.0 apps, we would manually force a lot of garbage collections just to tidy up the, the heap a bit when looking for memory issues. Is that still worth doing or not? Sorry, what do you do? So we would default, um, do a lot of gc.collects. gc.collects. Um, it, it depends on your code, and it depends on the XAML framework. Uh, what specifically, what was the reason that you were doing gc.collects in this case? Uh, we would have issues where pages would get left over. We wanted to make sure that it had tidied up any other, but sometimes pages would get um, get left in memory. And we wanted to make sure that it tidied up everything it, it could, yeah. rather than have that so distract the, or debugging? The answer is that I think you just have to try it and see. Um, they sort of are all, always optimizing the GC, and I know with every release of the phone, they, they sort of take a new look at the yeah. issues and try and improve it. What this new tool actually does show you is you do see, uh, I didn't mention this, but along the ruler at the top, it does show you all, where all the garbage collections happen in the code. So you can kind of use this to see um, where it's automatically doing GCs for you, and then you can sort of look at the memory growth to to figure out where you may or may not need to do your own, own collections. OK, with um, uh, battery consumption or energy consumption, yep. where might you see uh, energy consumption going up but not CPU issues or XAML issues as well? So if you're, if you're using network um, activity on your phone, you'll see a lot, of, a lot of network usage causing energy consumption. And that, that, that might not be a very CPU intensive operation. Or simply just having um, you know, a white display would use a lot more energy than, you know, a black background display. Okay. Sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you said always perf test in release on a physical device. Yep. Uh, we always start in debug on the machine, because um, if they've got issues there, you're really going to have issues on a device. Uh, for performance, not necessarily. Um, debug, debug, it makes sense to run uh, on, the, on your developer machine in the emulator, but for performance, um, there's a lot of extra checks that exist inside of the runtime. For example, one of the, the big popular ones is that for array indices, it actually checks on every array access that you're within range. And in my particular demo, that would have popped as a big performance issue. But as soon as I switch to release, it's not an issue as all, at all. So uh, with performance, I would, 
I would recommend doing release because uh, you might end up chasing down, spend time chasing down issues that aren't actually there. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yep, no problem. Oh, sure, no problem. I almost forgot about that. Let me switch back. Okay, 